Right. All right, are we, are we ready to go? We have almost everybody here. All right, let's, let, so, so you started it again? Yeah. Okay. All right, so um, let us just remember what we, let, let me recapitulate then. Let's, let's swing over here. We have the product of four infinitesimal uh, matrices in a particular representation. We know from this explicit computa computation that it's equal to 1 plus epsilon squared times the commutator of the generators, which are n by n matrices. Uh, and, and consequently, um, on the other hand, it has to be an element of the group because these are all elements of the group and this is a matrix representing the group, representing an element of the group. So this is some linear combination of the generators. We call those, those things the structure constants of the representation. And we get that the generators of the representation have a commutator that's the structure constants times the generators of that representation. But then we come over here and we recall that the, the two different representations, which may have different sizes, or they may have the same size, but be different representations. Both representations have to respect the commutation, the multiplication law of the group. So if G of epsilon, epsilon B then is a, epsilon B is a set of n parameters, um, and it's, it's only, they're all zero except for the epsilon that is that multiplies the generated TB, and this one is the same thing. But the, 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 they're all zero except for the epsilon that multiplies TA. The group multiplication law is this, and consequently, the two representations must respect, because the representations always respect the multiplication law of the group, you have then that the structure constants for the first representation, the second representation, have to respect this rule. But that means that, that the structure constants for representation one are equal to the structure constants of representation two and are equal to the structure constants of the group, which are the ones that occur here. And that's why when we, we had this k, we had to allow it to be free. We couldn't just say that it was a particular k. All right, an example, an important example is O3, the group of three by three matrices that leave dot products and vary. The algebra is this, and it tells us then that R transpose R is a three by three matrix. R transpose R is the identity. So that's what characterizes this. But you know that the determinant of a product is the product of the determinant. So the determinant of R transpose R, which is the determinant of the identity, which is certainly one is equal to the determinant of R transpose or the determinant of R, but the determinant of R transpose is the same as the determinant of R, so the determinant of R squared is 1. That means the determinant of R is plus or minus 1. If it's plus 1, we're talking about a rotation. Minus 1, we're talking about a reflection. A rotation and a reflection. This, um, set here, the ones that have um, determinant 1, they form a subgroup of O3, and that subgroup is called SO3, and it's contained in O3. These are the ones that such the determinant of R is plus 1. Notice that the ones that have determinant R minus 1, they don't form a group. Because if you have 2, R1 times R2, this has determinant minus 1, this determinant minus 1, and the determinant of the product 
is going to be minus 1 times minus 1, which is plus 1. So the ones with, who have net, the ones that involve a reflection, one reflection, don't form a group. So there are two groups, SO3 and O3. O3 include the reflections, but there's no restriction on the determinant. It could be plus or minus 1. Whereas um, uh, the ones with uh, determinant plus 1, they form a group. Okay. Now, what's the group? I'm just wondering if I should try to use the black and white book. What do you think? This guy is sort of with blonde hair is kind of tall. Um, I'm gonna just go like this. Well, no, we can't have you do that. But if you I'll just take have a trophy, maybe spirit. you can switch to here and we can go to the back. What do you think? I'll move as well or something. Okay, so our we have R is equal to I plus omega. Omega is tiny. It's a tiny three by three matrix. And so the rule is R transpose R is the identity. So that's I plus omega transpose times I plus omega is going to be one. This is I plus omega transpose plus omega plus omega transpose omega. This is super infinitesimal. We ignore it. And so we say omega transpose plus omega is zero. So the generators should be the omega transpose is minus omega. All right. These are three by three matrices. And so we can write them this way, omega 1 There's nothing sacred about this representation, but matrices, they're all anti-symmetric. These are the three generators. Notice that if we take omega b, consider it as a matrix, and we take the AC matrix element, in other words, row A, column C, what do we get? What we get is epsilon ABC. Okay, was that, was that allergies or? <laughs> Allergies. I promise. It was you again. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is called the Levi Chibita. The Levi Chibita symbol. Um, it's totally anti symmetric. And in fact, one can prove, and I'll do this next time, it's in the notes, that if the group is compact, then the structure constants are always totally anti-symmetric in ABC. But if they're non if it's non-compact, they aren't necessarily. These omegas are anti-hermitian, and the mathematicians live with that, and I think they they're more sensible. In the physics notation, we insist on things being Hermitian to be physical, and so we write this as I omega b. These guys are anti-Hermitian and real. This, the t's then are imaginary and anti-symmetric. So tb dagger is minus i omega b transpose which is I omega B, which is TB. So the T's are emission. And we're going to write the rotation matrix as I minus I theta B TB summed over B from 1 to 3. 
where the b's are just i times the omegas. These are the matrices that are close to the identity. Since they're close to the identity, and they have to have determinant one or minus one, they obviously have determinant one. So we're talking about S O three. All right, and these T's, it's I, and for compact groups, as I said, it's totally anisometric. I'll show you that on Monday. It's, uh, we get this, this rule here. We can, since they're totally anisometric, there's no point having the C up here. We can bring it down. And so, um, this thing is I epsilon ABC. ABC is such that epsilon 1, 2, 3 is equal to 1, and it's totally anti-symmetric, so you can figure out where all the others are. For example, epsilon 2, 1, 3 is minus 1. Okay. I probably need a T. That last line you wrote, the one with the I epsilon ABC, that needs I, <coughs> duh. Yes, you want to draw them. Okay. <coughs> Great, good point. Um, this turns out to be what's called the adjoint representation of SO3, and I'll say more about that on the list. In physics, what we do is we set the road, the generate, we, with the angular momentum we say are h bar times ta. So la is h bar ta, which is i h bar omega a. And these then satisfy the commutation of LALB is I H bar epsilon ABC LC. So those are the commutation of the angular momentum that you learned in quantum mechanics. I hope. What are the representations then? D of theta, we're talking rotation, so this is a rotation about axis theta hat and of length of theta radians. And this is, and roped right handed, this is e to the minus i theta dot L um, over h bar. Oh, and it's also equal to e to the minus i uh, theta dot t. And you can show that this in fact is equal to, if we take the ij elements of it, it's equal to cosine theta delta ij minus sine theta epsilon ijk theta k over length of theta, so theta k hat is what I could have said. So let me write it as theta k hat. Theta hat c k. Whoa! Sorry. <laughs> Plus one minus cosine theta theta hat i theta hat j. So that's, these i, j go from 1 to 3. It's a 3 by 3 uh, representation. All right, now I'm going to try to demonstrate these commutation relations. Oh my goodness, it's almost over. So, actually, good one. First, I'm going to put this here. Now, let's adopt a Euclidean coordinate system, x, 
Y, Z. Z is the usual it's a federal law. It has to be in the vertical direction. Um, X is going to be out this way. X, Y, Z. Okay. All right. Now, what I'm first going to do, and let me just make sure that I've got this right. Let me maybe write down what I'm going to do here. What I'm going to do is first e to the minus i epsilon Lx over h bar, e to the minus i epsilon Ly over h bar, e to the i epsilon Lx over h bar, e to the i epsilon Ly over h bar. And what is this going to be? Well, it's going to be e to the i epsilon squared. And it's, we know that f is uh, epsilon abc, so it's epsilon xyz lz, or 1, 2, 3 lz, which is just i epsilon. And there's an over h bar. So in other words, what I want to demonstrate is the commutation relations. That the thing that occurs here is 1. By showing that if we do the right-handed rotation about the x-axis that's small, right-handed rotation about the y-axis that's small, left-handed rotation about the x-axis, left-handed rotation about the y-axis, we're going to get a left-handed rotation about the z-axis. First, a right-handed rotation about the x-axis. That's the x-axis. All right. That's my infinitesimal rotation. <laughs> the next, and it was right-handed. Now we're going to do a right-handed rotation about the y-axis. I'm in sort of an awkward position here. Let me move this a little back, back a bit. Right-handed rotation about the... Um, y-axis, which is pointed toward you, and it's roughly that. Okay. Now we're going to do the inverse of the right-handed rotation or a left-handed rotation about the x-axis, and so this would be essentially that. And now I want to do a left-handed rotation about the y-axis so it's, instead of being this way, it's that way. And what have we seen? We've seen that the net effect is a left-handed rotation about the z-axis. This thing that was pointing at you somewhat aggressively is now directed in this direction. Okay? So indeed, and that's the plus sign here. The plus sign means it was left-handed. Now, of course, this isn't exactly right. It's also down a little bit. On the other hand, this was done by hand, not by computer. And the thing wasn't an infinitesimal rotation. It was a rotation of, I don't know, 20 degrees or so. OK, um, do you want to see it again? Or what should I do? I mean, in a sense, class is over. On the other hand, we had a pizza intermission, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. What do you guys want to do? Um, I'm happy to end class now. I could go on for another five or ten minutes to make up for the pizza break. Um, I'm, I'm happy to do whatever you want to do. All right, let's vote on it. Sorry. And who wants to end the class now? And you may be able to get more pizza. <laughs> I don't know. So end class now. Was that just one vote? All right, another five minutes. Story time. Story. Huh? Story. Story. Story time. Story. We want a story. Story time. <laughs> well, 
Did I tell you about Maya Rana? No. He disappeared so. um, sometime during the, um, the uh, Second World War, somewhere in Italy, on a ferry. I don't know if the ferry sank or if he was pushed off the ferry, jumped off the ferry. But my recollection is that was what happened to my mind. He was Something up. involved in the ferry. But he was never Be careful in the of Italian ferries. Actually, it was a it was a ship that went aground off Italy recently, but it was one of those pleasure cruises on the ferry. Yeah. I'm I'm <coughs> I'm, I'm afraid I don't I, I didn't think of a, of a I was so focused on this demo that I didn't think of a a, a story. I, I could turn spin and statistics into a story if you want, but that would be a story involving many equations, and I don't know if they want that. Yeah. Huh? Try it. Try it? <laughs> All right. All right, I will try to do spin and statistics quickly, and I think um, I'll, I'll redo spin and statistics um, on Monday because um, it's uh, <coughs> It's one of my favorite uh, things. Yeah, you can here. Oh, you have to go. Which one? Yeah, I had to go. And All right. Okay. Oh, this is your homework. Yes. All right. One minute. Yeah. All right. Okay. So let me try to do some statistics uh, quickly. First of all. How does a field behave under a, uh, a unitary transformation representing a rotation? R, it's a field that has an index x, space-time variable here, u inverse of r equals d. And it turns out that um, we can actually have two indices here, J, J prime, L, L prime of R inverse psi L prime of R of X. And um, I'm thinking, I think I, I've made this a little bit too elaborate here. Let's just call this D of J. In fact, can I borrow your pen again? All right. Um, now, how does this go? Well, we're going to be ro doing rotations about the z-axis. And so what we expect then is that all right, let me, let, me, let me start over again. Let me start over. Let's consider two states, AM and BM. These are both eigenstates of the rotation operator J3 with eigenvalue MH bar. So J3 on this is equal to H bar M times the state. And J3 on this is H bar M B M. And um, I'm, I'm, to make things simple, let me set H bar C equal to 1. Let's U and V be two space like points. So U minus V squared is greater than 0. Now, what you can always do is you can take a Lorentz transformation. So that you can go to a Lorentz frame in which, well, not simply a Lorentz transformation, but also a translation in space, so that these two points are Tx0,0 zero, zero, and T minus x0,0. Zero, zero. Let me just see if this is going to. Oh my god. Buy a new one. That is not. Doesn't matter. 
Okay. So, so let's consider then that um, one of these, what happens to this one that's Tx0,0, zero, zero, and we're doing a rotation about the z-axis, then this turns into something very simple. It's e to the, and it's a rotation of pi, so it's e to the i pi l, and that turns this into t minus x, 0, 0. So in other words, the field transforms this way, according to the, this representation of the rotation group, e to the i pi l, where L is the um, is this index. Now, so now let's consider the following. I, I warned you guys that this wasn't really suitable for story time. Okay? Um, but let's do it anyway. Let's consider B. M, and we're going to st uh, write this as psi L of Tx, psi L of T minus X, and I'm, I'm leaving out the zeros here, well maybe I'll put them in. This is A and A and B refer to other quantum numbers. Okay, now we're going to insert U adjoint U everywhere. So now let me write this as just TX. I'll leave out the zeros. Some other M. 
cake, k plus 1 over 2. So 2L is then an odd integer. So this whole thing is an odd integer times i pi. That's minus 1. Then when we pull it over to the other side, we get the, the matrix elements of the anti-commutator. <laughs> vanish. Now, this isn't a proof of spin and statistics, but it's an illustration. And let, us, let me just point out that it would have been only a slightly more difficult thing to use two different values of L, L and say L prime, because they would have given us uh, L plus L prime, and it would have given us an odd integer in, in that case, or an even integer in the other case. So, it's, so what this shows is that the spin determines the statistics. It's not a full-blown anti-proof of the theorem. You look unhappy. Are you sleepy? So, what? Are you sleepy? You're sleepy? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I guess we should uh, stop now. I'm sorry I didn't have a good job.